Mrs. Trimble, if you could let me know when uh, you're seeing us on YouTube, I would appreciate it. Oops, my granddaughter, of course, is gonna start crying right now. All right, I th it's thinking. Excellent, all right. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone to uh, an extension of National Biodiversity Teaching, and I want to thank Dr. David Bain from the Orca Conservancy for being here. Um, he has he has um, joined us before graciously, and um, and is a very popular uh, uh, scientist to watch. Um, and he he's going to share with us today what um, his passion is, which is. Um, orcas. And uh, with that, uh, Dr. David Bain, Chief Scientist of Orca Conservancy, um, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, whale food grows here and the importance of habitat restoration to recovery. Or another way of looking at it is, what is a whale biologist doing working in a forest? So for killer whale recovery, the whales need more food. And to give them more food, uh, we need to improve salmon survival. And one of the life stages of salmon is offshore uh, survival. And uh, they have a couple big problems in the open ocean uh, with not living long enough to get eaten by the whales. Um, one is temperature. Uh, salmon do not do very well in warm water, and we've had a problem with our oceans warming up. Um, they're used to some natural fluctuations like El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, but we've had a new problem over the last few years called the blob, and that's um, a patch of warm water off the west coast of the U.S. and Canada. And when that warm water blob forms, uh, it seems salmon have a very high at sea mortality. Another problem we're dealing with is the pH of the ocean is getting lower. It's becoming more acidic. So it would be like if we poured a bunch of lemon juice or vinegar in. And uh, the temperature problem and the pH problem uh, both trace to fossil fuels. So you're looking at a coal export terminal uh, in the Salish Sea, and um, this coal gets burned and puts carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere it traps heat and makes the earth a little bit warmer. And uh, it also dissolves in the ocean. And when it does that, it lowers the pH. And the problem with the lower pH is there are a lot of animals that make shells like clams and oysters and mussels. And um, when they're very small larvae, uh, the shells dissolve faster than they can make them. And without the shells, they don't develop normally and they don't live long enough to get eaten by larger animals. And that kind of takes out a whole layer of the food pyramid for them. And uh, what that means is there's less food for the salmon, so there are fewer salmon, and fewer salmon means there's less food for the whales. So one of the big things we need to deal with is reducing fossil fuels, fossil fuel use, and um, I think we've been able to do that by 30 or 40 percent responding to the virus the last few months. So, um, you know, there are ways to jumpstart that, though I think a lot of us are looking forward to being able to get out and about. Um, but uh, the reduction in fossil fuel use is going to be good for the oceans and good for the whales. So hopefully people who can work at home will continue to do that. Okay, before the whales get out to sea, they have to survive in the near shore. <clears throat> And coastal development is a big factor in nearshore survival. So on the left of the screen, you see downtown Seattle. And as you go along the beach there, it's pretty much all concrete at this point. 
uh, whereas the right half of the screen shows you what a natural shoreline might look like. And obviously, if you've got a lot more stuff growing, uh, there a lot more to eat. Um, also, you can see uh, some of the algae there is creating places to hide for small fish. So as juvenile salmon first get out to sea, having little hiding places like that is really helpful to them. So um, one of the areas we need to restore is our nearshore habitat. And uh, if you go back to the left of the screen, you can see Washington State Ferry here. And they're doing construction on the ferry terminal. And as part of that, they're trying to enhance the environment to provide a little bit of more natural habitat uh, in downtown Seattle so that uh, the fish going out to sea in that area uh, have a better chance to survive. Uh, but what salmon really like are eelgrass beds. So you can see the eelgrass bed on the screen here. And um, that provides places for the salmon to hide. And then there are also a lot of organisms that grow on the eelgrass. And uh, some of them feed on the eelgrass. And uh, when the eelgrass blades die off and sink to the bottom, uh, there are animals that feed on it there. So eelgrass is very important uh, for providing protection from predators and providing a food source. And then on the right, you can see a kelp bed and uh, juvenile salmon take advantage of kelp beds, but they're really beneficial uh, for the adult salmon is it gives them a place to hide from harbor seals and other predators. And uh, then when they pop out of the kelp, uh, the whales have a chance to eat them. So again, it's kind of replacing the concrete structures we saw in downtown Seattle uh, with native vegetation like this is going to be pretty important. And uh, Native Americans uh, worked on enhancing eelgrass beds in historical times. So that's something that's easy enough to do. and. Uh, local governments now are starting to look into enhancing kelp beds as well. Um, coastal vegetation is also important. And the reason it's important is there are a lot of bugs that live in the trees or shrubs or grasses that um, are near the coast. And they'll hop into the inner tidal where they can get eaten. And that kind of transfers some terrestrial nutrients to the marine environment. And uh, that means there's more food for everybody to eat. And again, if you think back to that picture of downtown Seattle, uh, there was no vegetation. So you're not going to have uh, much in the way of insects hopping into the water. So uh, the animals that live there are going to grow a lot slower. And one of the things we found is that salmon have to reach minimum size during the first six months or so at sea to have a good chance of reaching adulthood. And if they don't have food in the near shore, uh, they won't get big enough to have a good chance of surviving when they get out to the open ocean. Okay, um, the way water, fresh water gets into the ocean is also important. So on the left, you can see uh, where the Elwha River goes into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And uh, some of you may have heard that the Elwha dams were torn down several years ago. And a lot of the sediment that was trapped behind the dams was finally free to move to the sea. And you can see the estuary here where you've got a, little, a lot of little channels. And these are places where juvenile fish can hang out to stay out of the surf zone because they're not big and strong enough to deal with active water. Um, it also gives them more time to adapt to salt water because these areas will be a mix of fresh and salt water, whereas this will be pretty much straight salt water. So having this here is really beneficial. Another good thing about this structure is it's a place for what we call forage fish to spawn. So uh, fish like uh, sand lance uh, will lay their eggs in uh, sandy beaches like this. 
And uh, when their larvae hatch out, they're good food for juvenile salmon. So um, not only does this give them a place to get used to being in the ocean, it's also like having a cafeteria waiting for them at the end of their trip out to the sea. So um, this has been a very good thing. Uh, on the right, uh, you're looking at a culvert that goes under railroad tracks. And uh, you know, imagine being a juvenile salmon trying to get through here. So maybe at a really high tide, uh, you'll be able to swim through. Or um, you know, if it's been really rainy and there's a flood, uh, you'll have enough water to get through here. But uh, doesn't give the fish a chance to choose when to move through. So uh, their plans to restore this crossing by taking out the culvert and replacing it with the bridge. And that way, uh, fish will be free to move in and out. And the other good thing is that uh, sand and water will be move, free to move in and out. So instead of water only getting through when there's a lot of it and it's going really fast, it'll go through slowly and you'll get a little sandbar developing across there and that'll protect the fish coming out. Whereas the way it is now, the water, when it does come out, goes really fast and creates a channel straight to the sound and that makes it hard for the fish. So this is another example of restoration that can be done uh, to help increase the amount of food available to the whales. Okay, uh, this might be a good time for questions if we have any. Yes, you, have, you do have a couple of them in the okay. chat box there. Um, uh, we got people wondering what the biomass pyramid looks like for the or orca food chain and how much salmon is needed to support the current orca populations. And okay. kind of in that question oh. is also there was a question about um, when you're talking about this, the minimum size of a salmon, what is that? Oh, let's see, it's somewhere around six inches. Um, let's see, so in the marine phase, uh, there are a lot of uh, larvae of things like clams and mussels and oysters, uh, crabs, uh, juveniles of other fish species uh, that the juvenile salmon feed on. As they get out to sea, uh, they feed on larger fish. Um, and they'll also feed on the forage fish I mentioned, like sand lance and herring. And uh, ulicans are another one that uh, spawn in sandy beaches. And uh, the salmon can feed on those as they get larger. Uh, the forage fish are also great food for seabirds. and. Um, you know, harbor seals will go after them when they're abundant. Um, and then, um, you know, when the salmon get out to the open ocean, they eat a much larger variety of fish. Uh, as far as the whales at sea, you know, they're eating um, probably about 90% salmon. And uh, of that 90%, 90% uh, of that is Chinook salmon. So overall, about 80% of their diet is Chinook salmon, and another 10% is salmon species. And the last 10% is mostly other fish species, but they'll probably take squid every once in a while. And uh, I'll talk about the freshwater part of the salmon food chain uh, in the next section. OK, before you move on, um... We, we had a little question about the blob, that, that worm okay. section. How, how long has that been around? Is that relatively new? Uh, yeah, it's only been observed in, I don't know, about the last five years or so. So I think uh, it was a problem for about three years, and it cooled off for a year, and then it got warm again. So, um, yeah, it's something that uh, we hadn't observed before. So we're used to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which lasts roughly five years. Sometimes it does a cycle in two or three years. Uh, other times it might go 10. And then there's a Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, which tends to run on a scale of maybe 10 to 50 years. 
So um, those two things favor salmon in different areas and the El Nino phase is a lot worse for the salmon that the uh, southern residents are feeding on than the La Nina phase. And uh, when the PDO is cold in the south end, that's good for southern residents. And when it's cold in the north end, that's good for Alaskan residents. Okay, so for in-stream survival, uh, I guess juvenile salmon have two things to worry about. Uh, one is finding things to eat, and uh, there's a lot of restoration work that needs to be done to make that possible. And uh, here you're looking at a uh, man who was then the mayor of Bothell and uh, one of his staff members who was the mastermind behind uh, what's called a side channel restoration, where you can see the main river here and uh, when it rains the water here flows too fast for juvenile salmon so what he did is he arranged to have a side channel built uh, over in this area uh, where the water flows a lot slower and that way the juvenile salmon can go into the side channel to hide out uh, it also increases the surface area of the river meaning there's more room to find things to eat so uh, that's the kind of work we're trying to get involved in. Uh, on the other side of the screen, you can see uh, what's known as an invasive predator. And these are fish that uh, this particular one, I think it's from the Midwest where sport fishermen in the Midwest really love to fish for this. And my dad grew up in Wisconsin and he's always telling me stories about fishing for these guys. Um, but uh, they're very good at eating juvenile salmon and um, you know it's very hard for juvenile salmon to get past these fish and then we're finding that as night lighting increases um, these fish can feed night and day instead of just during the day and that's made it a lot harder for juvenile salmon to survive as well so um, having you know, street lights and park lights off at night uh, would be good for the salmon in urban areas. And these side channel restoration projects are another important thing to be doing. Um, so in the freshwater phase, we worry about water quantity. So you can see that if there's not enough water, it's kind of hard for the salmon to get upstream where they're trying to spawn. Uh, if there's uh, too much water, um, it can be a problem for the eggs, and I'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, we also worry about the water chemistry, and um, you know a lot of these test kits are easy enough to use that uh, even young kids can do the tests. And uh, we look for things like you know how much oxygen is in the water. Uh, if there's a little bit, you know, only worms can survive. And if there's a lot, then salmon can survive. And in between, you get a different mix of bugs that live in the bottom of streams. Uh, we also uh, worry about chemicals that get in the water. Uh, nutrients are one of the things we worry about. So those can come from um, uh, uh, gardens and lawns where people put fertilizer on uh, can also come from uh, leaky septic systems or leaky, leaky sewer pipes and the problem with too much nutrients is you get algal blooms and then when the algae die uh, they start decomposing and the decomposers take all the oxygen out of the water and as i mentioned salmon need a lot of oxygen so you get uh, too many nutrients in the water and uh, salmon can't survive. Uh, we also worry about industrial chemicals and uh, we have what's called an urban runoff mortality syndrome and what that is is when we have uh, rainy days all the chemicals that have collected on the streets uh, wash into the streams. 
And we're finding that if that happens during the salmon migration, uh, it can kill adult salmon within a few hours. And that doesn't give them time to spawn. And that means we don't have a next generation. The timing for those adults is wrong. And we think the chemicals and tires are the main ones responsible for that. Uh, also, things like pesticides can uh, reduce the insect population. And I'll talk in a minute about why that's important. Uh, another important thing we look for in streams is shelter. So I mentioned the uh, side channels is one way of providing shelter. Uh, another is large woody debris. And basically what that means is having trees and root balls and branches in the water. And those do a couple of things. Uh, one is they can slow the water down. So during storm events, the salmon don't get washed farther downstream than they want to be. And the other is it provides shelter because little salmon can get into these root balls and um, branches and the larger predators can't go in there to get them. So uh, those are pretty important. Uh, in the old days, you had trees growing next to streams and every once in a while they'd fall into streams and that would provide the large woody debris. Uh, but you know, if you're in an urban area where all the trees have been cut down, uh, people have to actually put trees on a truck and drive them to the side of the stream and put them in the water. And in some places they have to chain them down so they won't get washed away in a flood. Uh, but it seems to be worth the trouble from the salmon point of view to do that. Okay, um, insects are an important food for salmon when they're in streams. And uh, what you're looking at on the left here, I uh, think are mainly uh, stoneflies. And a lot of these insects have a larval phase where they'll live in the stream for a year or more, and then they'll have a brief adult lifespan and uh, they need uh, streamside vegetation to survive that adult phase and uh, lay eggs to produce the next generation of larvae. So uh, juvenile salmon need these, but these insects need plants near the stream uh, to reproduce successfully. Okay, another thing uh, we worry about is temperature. So on the left, you can see a river that's flowing next to a golf course. And you can see there's very little tree cover next to it. Oops. Um, you can also see that the channel's been straightened so that uh, when the sun's shining in this way, even if you did have trees by the side, uh, there wouldn't be much shade. On the right, you can see a little stream that's flowing through the forest and uh, it's got lots of shade um, because the forest produces a porous soil. Uh, the water kind of spreads into the dirt and uh, gets cooled off by the dirt as well. Uh, whereas over here, uh, you've got rocks lining the side and then you've got compacted soil with some grass on it so that uh, the water basically runs straight into the river and doesn't get cool. So if you look at you know a thousand feet of flow in the river, uh, the temperature doesn't change very much. Uh, but if you look at a thousand feet of this little stream throwing through the forest, the temperature can drop by seven degrees Fahrenheit. So um, the kind of vegetation we have next to the stream uh, can be very important to regulating its temperature. And um, you know, when you hear concerns about global warming, uh, you know, people are freaking out over a three or four degree uh, Fahrenheit temperature change. And if we can offset that with a seven degree drop by planting vegetation near our streams, uh, that can offset a lot of that from salmon. So one of the projects I'm working on is trying to plant trees in the 200 feet next to the river so as they grow up, they'll provide shade, you know, at least when the sun's on coming from this side. So that should uh, help cool the river and uh, that should make it easier for the salmon to migrate upriver. 
Okay, uh, vegetation next to a stream is very important. Uh, you want little plants that are called ground cover, uh, some slightly larger ones that are called shrubs. And then of course you want the big trees and um, you know, you've got some big trees on the right. And you also want these to be native because our local insects know how to live on these plants. But if you bring in plants from Asia, like Himalayan blackberry or Japanese knotweed, our insects don't know how to eat them. And that gives those plants an advantage because they don't have to spend any of their time feeding the insects and deer and things like that in the forest. Um, and um, so that means we wanna make sure we have native plants rather than what are known as invasive species. So I mentioned blackberry is a species that can take over. And uh, one of the things students have been working on for about 10 years now is coming into the forest and removing these invasive species. And then we replace them with native species. So they'll uh, plant you know, little cedar trees and uh, Indian plum and uh, some sword ferns and um, try to get these invasive species replaced with native species to help our local insect population. And our local insects are what feed the salmon and our salmon are what feed the whales. Um, with trees, we kind of have two general types of trees. One are deciduous trees. And those are the ones that lose their leaves in the fall. So you just have branches in the winter. Uh, the other type are the conifers that retain their needles year round. And there's important difference, even though they're both natives, and that has to do with how they handle rainfall. So in the Pacific Northwest, our rainy season uh, tends to be um, over the winter, which means that if you have a watershed that's mostly deciduous, uh, the rain goes straight to the ground and that can uh, you know, hit the ground pretty hard and cause some erosion. And then it also runs into streams very quickly. So it contributes to flash flooding. Uh, in contrast with the conifers, they kind of hit the needles at the top of the forest and then they'll drop down to the next branch and hit the needles there and drop to the next branch. And it can take hours for a raindrop to get from the top of the tree uh, down to the ground. And then um, in a forest, once it gets to the ground, uh, it'll hit the dead leaves from previous years and you know drip from one leaf to the next and then finally make it into the ground. Um, in contrast, if you have an urban setting, you know it just hits the street, goes down the storm drain, and goes into the stream right away. And uh, the problem with that is that uh, in those urban areas, you get flash floods, uh, which are bad. And then there's no water in the ground to make it into the streams over the summer, which is our dry season. And that means our water levels get really low and the water warms up a lot. So uh, I mean, this vegetation is quite important, especially the coniferous trees. Okay, uh, spawning habitat, or actually, why don't we take a break for questions here and then I'll get into spawning habitat. Yes, we have quite a few questions here. Okay, um, all dealing kind of with the restoration uh, inland. Then how many miles from the coast are you focusing those restoration um, activities on? Uh, well, I live about eight miles from the coast and I'm focusing my efforts close to home because that means I don't have to drive and you know, put CO2 into the atmosphere and wear out rubber tires that put all those toxic chemicals into the water. Um, but these need to happen everywhere. So I would say we need probably tens of thousands of little projects where, you know, groups of, you know, 10 or 50 people get together and uh, work on a small area to restore it. And when they finish one area, they can move on to the next. Um, so, um, are most you know, 
most of these activities then are volunteer efforts. Is there any um, concerted effort, you know, either from a university or from the government to uh, take in these, take on these um, inland restoration projects? Yeah. Um... You know, a lot of governments are strapped for money, and that's going to be even worse uh, with the economic conditions we're in right now. So um, the way things are working here is government will try to come up with the money to buy the land for the restoration work to be done. So that golf course was purchased with government funds, and there will probably be uh, restored primarily by volunteers. Uh, we're collaborating with the local universities and colleges because uh, they have expertise in how to do the restoration work. And they have students who are trying to, you know, learn enough about restoration to pursue careers in it. So um, uh, one of the groups I work with is called Friends of North Creek Forest. And we've had a relationship with uh, what's called the University of Washington restoration ecology network and um, basically we get a about a half dozen seniors each year that uh, lead a restoration project for a patch of forest and then uh, we bring in hundreds of uh, volunteers from the community to work with them so basically their role is primarily leadership that if we need to, you know, move mulch hundreds of feet, you know, we'll bring in, you know, 100 people from the community and form a bucket brigade. And, you know, we can move the mulch from the road to the part of the forest where it's needed. Um, and I think a lot of uh, locations are going to that sort of model where uh, government will buy the land and uh, set it aside as a park. And then uh, you can do restoration work to make it salmon friendly and you might throw in a few trails to make it people friendly as well. And by having volunteers do the work, uh, you save local governments hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And, you know, if you're in a small town, hundreds of thousands of dollars are a lot of money. And, you know, they turn down the grants to buy the land because they can't afford to take care of it, but if they know they've got community volunteers, then they can say, yes, we'll buy the land and the volunteers will take care of it. And the nice thing about native vegetation is usually a few years after you plant it, it's ready to take care of itself. So, um, you know, you get a, enough volunteers to handle about three years of restoration sites and then, you know, site one is done and they move on to site four. So, um, you know, you don't have an ever increasing number of volunteers you need to maintain uh, an increasing amount of restored land. You just kind of have enough volunteers to maintain ones that are in their first few years of restoration. So when you're looking for volunteers, is it, um, are you getting people that are like fans of the orcas and so they go oh this is what i can do or is this people that are just looking for something close to home that will have a big impact uh both so um when we need a big group of volunteers like these bucket brigades i was talking about mm -hmm. uh we'll publicize it in the orca community oh nice and we usually get an extra hundred volunteers doing it that way uh you know some are people who just like to garden and you know, planting a sword fern in the forest is not really different than, you know, planting a, a fern in their yard. So they come out and do it. Um, a lot of school kids come out to do it because they learn how to do some planting. And, you know, for kids who live in apartments that don't get to do that at home, it's a nice new experience for them. So, um, you know, we have you know, some people who are retired and looking for things to do. And, you know, uh, we have some kids that really love to do it. And, uh, you know, we'll teach lessons in the forest. And as a break from the academic part, we'll have them uh, do some stewardship work. And that way they 
learn some practical things about planting plants and you know removing invasive species and uh, how they can help steward the habitat. That's that's very similar to some stuff that we do here in way inland here in Illinois. Yeah. Um, so we have problems with storm waters making those those um, stream beds wider too, and it looks like yeah. it's a lot of water, but it's kind of very shallow on the edges. So um, does the actual storm water itself is it affecting the orca in the same way as it kind of is ours, where you, around here where it's kind of the storm water is washing out so much stuff that it's polluting the ocean parts? Um, yeah, although orcas don't drink water, so we think the main way that gets into them is through the food. Okay. So, um, you know, we've done drug testing on our salmon and, you know, we're finding that, you know, they get cocaine and uh, birth control pills and all sorts of other stuff in them and that'll accumulate in the orcas. Uh, we also been doing testing of mussels and uh, we have, uh, Muscles that live near the outfall from a hospital that treats a lot of cancer patients. Ooh. And we found that some of the muscles accumulate enough cancer drugs that uh, eating a mussel is equivalent to the dose they would get at the hospital. So, um, you know, a lot of these chemicals are getting out into the environment. Um, we don't think that they're causing problems directly with the orcas. Uh, the ones we're worried about having a direct effect on them are things like DDP that, you know, is what's called a persistent organic pollutant. So even though it was banned in the 70s, uh, our whales still have fairly high levels of that. Uh, PCBs are another one. They were also banned in the 70s, but Puget Sound was a dumping ground for them. So you know, all the stuff that's growing up in Puget Sound is accumulating these uh, PCBs and that causes birth defects and, uh, you know, basically either keeps calves from being born alive or, uh, you know, they survive you know, less than six months once they are born. And then flame retardants are another class of chemicals that we're worried about. Is we're getting a lot of those showing up in the whales, but we haven't had time to study what the effects are because those are a fairly new source. Uh, but we tend to be more worried about the direct effects on salmon. So I mentioned this urban runoff mortality syndrome that's uh, killing a lot of salmon and that's reducing the food supply for the whales. So, so will will orcas? I, I assume that when they're the salmon are dead, that they're floating and probably a lot of them in the ocean. Are, will they eat dead fish or are they only going to go after the living and struggling fish? Uh, they only go after the living fish. Okay. And they'll usually chase them for a while and wait for them to get tired. And uh, you know, if they get tired too quickly, they may just kind of poke them on the tail rather than eat them. So uh, the salmon can have parasites in them. And, uh, we had an orphan two-year-old whale that came down here uh, a little over 15 years ago, and she was eating fish, but her stomach filled up with parasitic worms and didn't leave any room for her to eat real food that um, you know she could live on. Uh, so she got really sick, and we had to rescue her and treat her for the worms, and then uh, give her food to let her put weight back on and then we sent her back home and uh, you know she reunited with her pod and grew up and uh, has a couple calves of her own now so uh, that was a successful thing but it also points out how important it is to the whales not to eat the wrong things and a lot of marine animals run into similar problems where they're eating plastics and they fill up on plastics and they don't have any room for real food and they end up starving as a result. Okay, you'd made a reference earlier about uh, Southern residents or Alaskan residents. Can you kind of explain yeah. what that's all about? Okay, so I think there are actually several different species of killer whale and Pacific Northwest 
uh, one species is the resident killer whale, and it has a subspecies known as southern residents, uh, which are JK and L pod, and they're the ones that range from Monterey Bay to about southeast Alaska. And then the other subspecies, uh, what we call northern residents, and there's a northern resident population that lives primarily in British Columbia, but goes into Southeast Alaska. And then there's another uh, Southeast Alaska community that goes from Southeast over to Prince William Sound. And then there's a Prince William Sound community that uh, goes from Prince William Sound uh, out uh, into the Pribilofs and the Aleutians. And then, uh, you know, there's kind of a Russian resident uh, population that um, lives in Russia and uh, probably used to extend in Japan, but Japan did a lot of whaling, so uh, they probably don't have any, or at least not very many residents anymore. Uh, another species we have here are transient killer whales, and those are the ones that feed on marine mammals. And then the third species we have are called offshores, and they feed on things like sharks and sea turtles and tuna. Oh, I didn't realize there were so many different species. Yeah, and then you go into the Southern Hemisphere and they've got their own suite of species down there. Okay, uh, here's another question somebody had, um, speaking of the evolution of orcas, and said, were they in the group of tetrapods that left the ocean and then returned, or did orcas, orca lineage kind of stay in the water? Okay, well, by the time they got to be orcas, they stayed in the water. So um, orcas have been around as long as uh, the humanoid apes have been around. So kind of the earliest members of our genus uh, originated about the same time as uh, the earliest um, members of the killer whale genus. Um, historically, you know, we think life originated in the ocean and then you had fish that managed to crawl on to land and uh, became amphibians, which became reptiles, uh, which became birds and mammals. So you had uh, terrestrial mammals that uh, went back into the ocean around 60 million years ago. And, uh, you know, they kind of walked back and forth uh, as their legs went away. Uh, you had whales that, um, you know, basically spent their whole lives in the ocean. And, um, you know, probably for at least 45 million years, uh, they've never set foot on land. Uh, in contrast, you have the seals and sea lions, which represent a separate invasion of the ocean. And they come back to land uh, to breed and to molt. So, you know, they usually come to land at least a couple times a year. Uh, some of them come to land more often than that. And then another group of mammals that went into the ocean are the Cyrenians, which are the sea cows or manatees and dugongs and uh, they live a fully aquatic life uh, the way whales do. Okay. All right. I think that answered that question. I think we're ready to head back into spawning. Okay. So if you look very carefully here, you can see the gravel's a little bit lighter in color. And when salmon lay their eggs, uh, they'll stir the gravel around and that'll clean off the algae and you know, dirt that's settled on the gravel. So it'll look a little brighter and it's known as a red. And reds have a few important properties. Uh, one is the gravel size. Uh, if gravel's too big like this, uh, it doesn't provide enough protection for the eggs. Uh, the eggs will just get washed out of the gravel and um, be exposed where all sorts of things can eat them. Uh, if there's too much sand, uh, the eggs will get smothered. Uh, so, you know, you don't want stuff that's too small or too big. Uh, you need a lot of gravel that's just right. Uh, 
Um, another important thing that the eggs need is oxygen. And um, there are kind of two factors that are important in that. Uh, one is the water flow. So if you have stagnant water like a pond or you know drainage ditch where the water is really not moving very much, uh, the eggs are exposed to the same water for a long time. So they'll take the oxygen out of it and there's nothing left uh, before the oxygen gets replaced. Uh, but if you have good water flow, uh, they're constantly exposed to new water that has oxygen in it. Another big factor in how much oxygen is in the water is the temperature. So as it turns out, as the temperature goes up, the oxygen level goes down. So it's very important for water flowing through the reds has a lot of oxygen in it. And uh, the flow is also very important. So um, if you have very high flow, uh, like you see here, um, that'll do a couple things. One, it'll wash all that uh, right-sized gravel away and just leave the really big rocks in place. And the other is it causes, or that's known as scouring. And uh, not only will it take the little rocks out, but it'll take any eggs that were laid in the little rocks. So you know, when the salmon come back, you know, they'll know what the stream is flowing like. And if they see something like this, they know they need to go farther upstream. Um, and what they want is kind of water that's got a medium flow to it. And that'll you know, wash away the sand, but not the gravel that they like to spawn in. And it'll you know, provide the eggs with fresh oxygen, uh, but it won't scour them away. Uh, so having the right flow is pretty important. And obviously the flow will vary with the rainfall. So um, if you've got a big storm event, um, it's going to try to produce something like this, um, but the salmon need it to stay like that. And the way you get it to stay like that is to have a lot of vegetation around the stream. So I mentioned earlier that if you have the conifers there, um, you know, it may pour for four hours. And if it poured for four hours in a parking lot, all that rainwater would go into the creek in a four hour period. Uh, but if you have a lot of conifers by the stream, um, you know, some of that rain will, you know, find the hole through the branches and hit the ground right away. Uh, but some of it's going to take hours to come through. And, um, you know, depending on whether it hits the very tops of trees or, you know, hits a lower branch, it's going to get uh, to the stream at a different time. And that means that, you know, that four hour rainfall event may get spread out over 12 hours. And, um, you know, that means you don't have the surge and flow like this. You get to, keep the flow more like that. And basically what that means is as you revegetate a watershed, uh, the salmon can spawn lower down because you, know, you won't have enough water coming in to uh, cause uh, flashy events like that. And um, you know, higher in the watershed, um, you know, you'll have low flows that are pretty stable because you're not concentrating water over a large area. Um, but, you know, these streams in this area might be 10 or 15 miles long. So if you're, you know, say in the top mile, um, maybe you're too high up for it to stay wet all winter and you don't want your eggs to dry out. And if you're in the bottom couple miles, you know, it may get flashy like that and you don't want to spawn there. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned that if you do have a lot of vegetation around the stream, it will help water get into the ground. And once it's in the ground, it can take a long time. So that'll keep the stream wet for a longer period of the year. Uh, so uh, streams that might dry out will have a good flow like this. And they'll also prevent the flashy flow like that. So the stream side vegetation is really important because it regulates the flow, which regulates the availability of spawning habitat. Uh, it also regulates the food supply uh, 
uh, for the fish once they grow up. And it also provides, you know, shelter uh, for the fish to hide out in when they're growing up, whether they're hiding out from predators or hiding out from flooding. Before so, you, right. well, good. This works so out that's well. what I wanted to cover. <laughs> and I'm ready for last round of questions and um, hope you learn why all these whale people brought their whale to the forest to help restore it. Okay, I had a, a few questions here about um, the salmon and their spawning. What time of the year do they spawn? Uh, in the old days, they spawned year round. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now we have kind of a, with Chinook, we have a summer run uh, that still exists in most places. Uh, there's also a spring run that um, is a different species, even though they look identical, but they've probably been separate for about 15 million years. And, um, reason we don't have a lot of spring runs anymore is you know they're trying to grow up during the summer and if you're in an urban area or an area that's been cleared for agriculture uh, the water just gets too warm in the summer for them to survive uh, you also had a fall run and winter run chinook so um, you know you used to have you know four peaks during the year when salmon were returning and those peaks could spread out a month or two. So you probably had about eight months uh, where fish were actively spawning. And then you have uh, different species of salmon, like, um, you know, in this area, we have Chinook that start going up the rivers in August. And then, um, you know, you might get uh, coho going up in September and then uh, chum going up October, November. And since we don't have a winter run anymore, you don't have that winter run of Chinook kind of being the next in the sequence. So what our whales typically do is move out into the Pacific and try to feed on fish along the Pacific coast instead of the inland waters the way they do during the summer. But now uh, even our summer runs are declining so last year, uh, you know, our whales were only inshore for a few days during the summer Chinook run. And they're actually around more for the uh, September coho and uh, fall chum run uh, than they were for the summer Chinook that were kind of the center of their universe for the previous 45 years. So their diet is kind of, looks like it's shifting then, huh? Um, well, they seem to go where the food's most available. So even different ri rivers will have different timing. So I mentioned that orphaned whale we took care of. And, uh, you know, her family usually was in Johnson Strait at the north end of Vancouver Island, uh, starting about the middle of July. And um, I did work with their family in the spring and they were uh, much farther north on the central coast of British Columbia. So, you know, we look at the time in the Chinook runs and the, uh, you know, kind of early spring uh, Chinook runs were on the central coast uh, when her family was there. And uh, when the runs were coming into the lower mainland uh, during the summer, uh, her family was down off the lower mainland. So, um, you know, they do take advantage of the timings of the runs and, um, you know, they do the best they can with what they've got and they're flexible. So if they have a bad year with one run then they'll go somewhere else where the runs better. Are you getting the big storm events like we are here in the Midwest a lot more recent, you know, recently, like within the last probably five years where we're getting much heavier rains that are happening um, more frequently? Yeah, our weather has been more variable, though. I think Washington has seen less change in our weather than most places have. Um, so we did have some very large storm events where, um, you know, one of the 
salmon bearing creeks near where I live, uh, went through one of those little culverts like I showed for the railroad and uh, it got plugged up by debris. So instead of the creek uh, flowing out to sea, it flowed into downtown of the city and took them a week or two to dry out. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was a problem. And they've since replaced that culvert with a much larger one that's easier for fish to get up and easier for debris to get down. And, uh, you know, we had our major interstate highway flooded for an extended period of time. So uh, we have had big rain events, but we've also had some winters that have been the driest on record. And, you know, we expect variability in that because, like I said, there's variation driven by the PDO and there's variation uh, driven by El Nino. Um, but I think we're seeing those effects magnified as the overall climate gets warmer and there's more energy in the atmosphere. So I think it may be better to think of that as the jet stream curves a lot more sharply than it used to. Uh, you know, you kind of look at Jupiter and you've got a lot of stripes that are pretty straight going around all the way around the planet. Uh, if you look at our jet stream, we'll see it goes way south and then way back north and way south. And, you know, when it goes way south in the Midwest, you get those, that polar vortex coming down and things get really cold. And, um, you know, if it goes back the other way, you have tornadoes in winter, which you know, didn't happen very often 50 years ago. So, um, you know, we're kind of seeing weather changing. And like I said, salmon need that moderate flow. So having big storm events is really bad for them and having droughts is really bad for them. And, um, you know, they just have to hope that they get a good year before they have too many bad years in a row. And that's not happening as often as it used to. And that's why this restoration work is so important because that'll let the salmon survive in a much wider range of weather conditions. This has been very interesting seeing the connection to orcas, um, so much of their food chain being linked to land. It's, it's not one of those things that you normally think about. And especially here in the Midwest, I'm, I'm seeing the pictures that you have and the, the forest, the, the conifer forests with the ferns is all I ever imagine the Northwest looking like. <laughs> and deciduous trees, you have those? Oh, amazing. Yeah. And your streams look so much like ours. And when we do our stream monitoring, it's pretty yeah. much the same stuff that we are monitoring for. I'm sure our streams get a lot warmer than yours do, but um, it's interesting to know that the parameters for each stream have a very real effect on what's happening all the way down into the oceans. So. Yeah, so one of the things we do is we study the macroinvertebrates in our streams here. And it turns out we can use the same protocol they're using in Alabama. So yeah. even though our water tends to be a lot cooler, um, you know, we have the same major groups of macroinvertebrates living in there. So we have, you know, our crustaceans and you know, our big groups of insects and you know, the snails and crayfish and things like that. So those... It's the same stuff we're, we're monitoring here in our street yep. that runs through yep. our high school campus. And when when you said stoneflies, I was like, oh, we get so excited when we see stoneflies. If we saw that yeah. many, we'd have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, well, waters aren't quite cool enough to be able to support yeah, Stoneflies only do well in clean water. So, oh. you know, if you don't have clean, cool water, they have a hard time. And like I said, they're worms that, you know, don't have to move around very much. So they do fine when there's not much oxygen in the water. And uh, they actually probably like it better when there's not much oxygen because the predators can't chase them. Yep. Well, we're nearing the top of the hours and I think we have uh, hit all of our questions now. I want to thank you very much for all of your help and all your insight into understanding um, food chains for orcas. And we hope we get to hear from you again in the future. Okay. Hopefully we won't be in a COVID type lockdown situation next time that we hear from you. <laughs> yeah, we'll that's probably going to look pretty much the same where I'll, I'll be on the screen. But, that's true. Um, that is true. But the, the overwhelming anxiety won't be there for so many of us. <laughs> so. Yeah. And um, yeah. And then, um, you know, 
all these kids will be back out in the forest. They won't be. Yeah, so they'll be able to stand next to each other. Locked down. So, um, yeah, I think we'll probably have a lot of weeds to deal with when we're allowed to get back yeah. out there. Yes, I think I think you're right. That's what I went. I walked through our woodland and I said, "Oh dear, this is what happens when we don't have young volunteers." So. Mm -hmm. But even old people can make good volunteers. So yes. <laughs> you know, even if they're too old to dig out blackberries, they can you know, serve cookies and lemonade and things like that to keep the young people going. Well, thank you once again. And thanks everyone else for participating. And we'll see you all later. Thank you. Hey, thanks everybody for listening.